I understand the ripple effect that it's going to happen if I was to take my life today, you know, my kids, my loved ones, family, brothers, sisters, when I stood there on the chair about to take my own life and I was standing on the chair, I had the rope around my neck and I'm about to take my life and sending a text message to my oldest daughter, not telling him what I'm about to do, but just tell him that I love him and I'm, and I'm sorry for, you know, for being a failure in their life. My daughter replied back with it, with a text message, which saved my life. What is cracking Hope Nation? It is your friendly neighborhood, Kevin Hines. And this is yet another episode of the Hindsights podcast. It's a, it's a very special episode. We have the one, the only, the man, the myth, the legend, Soa the Hulk, fighting champion, amazing human being, humanitarian, suicide preventer, and all around great person. So uh, thank you for joining us on the Hindsight Podcast. I really appreciate it. How the heavens are you? Yeah, I'm good, Kev. I mean, I've been meaning to kind of do something with you because love the stuff you do um, in, in the US, but also I, I know you're over here in Australia as well. So we kind of missed each other. But uh, hey, thanks for having me on. I really do appreciate this opportunity to kind of share this podcast with great, uh, great minded people. Well, I, I'm just glad to 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 have you on. It, it means the world to me to do so, and um, I'm grateful you said yes. So thank you very much. Um, let, let's you know before before we get into y- your story and the questions I have for you today, I really would like uh, for you to tell us, the listeners, uh, the viewers, the subscribers of the Hindsight Podcast, I'd like you to tell us about the who, why, what, where, when, and how. Uh, you grew up and, and where you came from, really, if you can. Yeah, so I uh, I was born in Newcastle, New South Wales. That's where I was born. I was kind of brought up in in, uh, in Tonga. So um, I guess it's not I'm not sure if, if anyone that's listening and watching this. Um, Tonga is uh, near, the, it's in the Pacific Islands, so not far from Fiji. It's a 30-minute, uh, uh, you know, plane ride from Fiji, unless you're, you're swimming. And that, that takes about two weeks to swim, unless you get in by sharks, but don't swim. Um, but, <laughs> But um, but it's mate, it's it's awesome when when we talk about um the tropical um you know there's palm trees there's you know coconuts and uh, you know and the only thing you can do there is kind of climb climb coconut trees and, and drink drink coconuts and sit by the beach so that's pretty cool, <laughs> um, but it's one of those things that um uh, you know I think I guess why my mum and dad sent me over there is to learn the language learn the history and just learn the culture or just where they were from so that was pretty cool you know so um, um and then obviously brought back to Newcastle New South Wales so. At a young age, I was, you know, kind of growing up in Newcastle where we went into a bit of turmoil. But, um, you know, growing up as a kid, it was hard. Um, mm. Like, you know, people can can probably relate to in, in what in what they've gone through as, you know, kind of growing up through, you know, the, the physical and, and, and the abuse and that, you know, kind of... Uh, kind of growing up but in my culture so where i'm from is Tong- uh, tongan a lot of that kind of physical abuse was kind of um was kind of like normal um you know to smack you know it's not those kind of smack on the bottoms don't do that again it was like you know um you know flying across the room or or like you know tables extended cords but it's it's i wouldn't change anything um because it's made me the person who i am today so wow incredible well so uh, you know let, let's um I have to ask you when, when did you you, you, you went through a, a you know for, for some people they would say it was a traumatic time the the abuse you endured yep. um the, the the beatings and such and we'll get into that a little bit later because I have some questions about that but but when did you first start training in mixed martial arts I know it was a young age that you started training in the in, in that in those fields but can you tell us more about that yeah, obviously, as a kid, kind of growing up, I, I started off with boxing just to kind of, you know, just to stay out of trouble and and stuff, and and learning martial arts discipline, um, of from martial arts, and went into kind of, um, uh, I played a lot of sports. I played rugby uh, as a sport. I played basketball as a sport, and that was high level sport as well. When here um, in 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 Western Australia, but I, I moved up north uh, with with my mum and dad um, after I left Newcastle. I ran away, but uh, then obviously finding our spot in in WA, which is Perth, Western Australia, and um, kind of growing up there and and finding sports that um, that I wanted to do, but also that helped me because let's say the UFC. And when I do talk about the UFC, the 
I don't like fighting in in but I use the UFC and it kind of helped me in what I was going through pacing up and down you you walk into the octagon there's only two people in there but the person I was I was always imagining across the 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 octagon was never the person I was fighting it was the person that that kind of hurt me as a kid so I was always they used to fire me up but I understood that it was just a band-aid over something that I was going through at that time and, and it was helping me cope with what I was going through, the mental health problems that I was going through. And like everyone else um, that has mental health problems, whether it's, you know, depression, anxiety, or whatever they go through on a day-to-day -day basis, or what they do to help them cope with what they're going through. Um, you know, whether it's exercise, whether it's going to the gym, that helps them. There's a lot of benefits to that. But for me, hopping into the octagon was a coping thing for me that helped me get through what I was going through. Because if it wasn't for the UFC, I, I think I would have suicided already. Um, wow. And that could help me. Sit backstage. Guys used to give me a high five. Oh, yes, we won. You've knocked him out. Let's go and party. I used to sit in the toilet and cry. Why? It's because I couldn't reach out to my coach. I couldn't go, coach, man, I'm struggling today. Because... I think in life, Kev, and I, I think you you know this, like in, like everyone that is going to, that is watching this podcast, that in life we all assume things. We assume things on if we were to reach out to someone and what they would say. But in reality, if we were to reach out to somebody and, and they sit down and go, "Hey, listen, I am struggling today. Can can I have a chat?" They probably would have sat down and go, "You know what? We need to get your help." Yeah. And, and me reaching out to my coach, I couldn't co reach out to my coach and say, "Coach, you know, I'm struggling today," because I was assuming my coach would turn around and say, "Mate, you're the Hulk." You know, you're one of the modern day gladiators that hop in the octagon for a living. Mate, whatever, mate. Come on. You're the Hulk. These are the kind of comments that fuel that stigma, as you know. Yeah. Kev. So I was battling with with, with a lot of that uh, through, through, but also using the, uh, the training, using the UFC as a coping mechanism for myself to help me get through a day-to-day -day basis. And I guess that's why I wrote my book called Face Your Fears, because every day I wake up and face my fears, whether I'm having a positive day, get out of bed, yeah, I'm ready to rock and roll, or waking up one morning, waking up in the morning and thinking to myself, facing my fears and thinking to myself, oh, I don't want to get out of bed today. I'm depressed. I haven't had much sleep. And that's so, and, uh, and talking about it. And then I guess hearing your story and, and, and your story is an amazing story. There's so many times I've, I've played your video um, in presentations that, mate, look, look, if you think, check out Kevin's video and where he's jumped from and where he's, uh, and that's a, an amazing story. And, and and they love that, that whole where, um, you know, you, that you thought it was, it was, was it, was it a shark that was in the water? Or was it, you know, and it was actually a seal and it's, it's an amazing story. And, and I love that story. And that's just like, for you to come back from that, it's like, you know, and that's, and I truly believe, Kev, um, story saves lives, right? Yeah. Uh, my story or your story that you tell might empower and, and encourage someone else to tell their story about what they're, what they're going through. All of a sudden, they're having a conversation with someone else. Heard Kevin's story. Oh, geez, my, my God, how did he go through that? But I have a similar story, not like that, but I, I relate to what he was going through. And telling their story and and i think that the more storytellings that we can kind of do the better it is i think you're absolutely right and i think people forget and, and a lot of people don't even know that storytelling or stories are 22 times more memorable than statistics or facts yeah and when you tell a story to an audience of any kind whether that's on a video like a video podcast or an audio podcast like we're doing yeah. both here or whether that's in person on a stage in front of a crowd or whether that's in a film in which you're portraying a character, but you're telling a story, the story you're telling creates new neural pathways in the brain synapses and neurons are, are firing and connecting. And the audience relates to that story. They yeah. literally, their brain sync up with the storyteller, the storyteller's brain, and they feel empathy for what they're going through. But then if you end that story with a positive, hopeful, meaningful uh, movement toward change in their lives, they go home, they do the work, and they stay here. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's yeah. phenomenal. And, I, and it saves lives. Like your presentation and your story, like and you telling your story, but also giving them a, a, a happy ending to that story on, look, you can reach out. At the end of the day, I don't want you or, or Kevin doesn't want you to be here where we were about to, where you were about to jump off uh, the Golden Gate Bridge. Me about to kind of take my own life, about to 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 hang myself and suicide. You know, um, we don't want you to be at that stage. We want you to be down here 
where you see the signs early, you get help, you get educated, you hear our story, which will help you and empower you to kind of tell your story and, and, and get help. And it's, I think it's so powerful that um, it's one of these things, that it's a story that kind of, where, where I was sitting, while I was sitting down, had of having a conversation with a, 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 cl a clinical psychologist. It's one of these things, we had a meeting and, and we sat down and, and um, her, um, this person's um, great program, like unbelievable program, next level program. Um, and, and I said, you know what, your, your program is next level. Um, it's like it hits, you know, the the corporate level, ticks the boxes. That's awesome. Um, but I'll tell you what a successful, what makes a successful mental health program or a successful kind of um, presentation. Um, and they said, what, 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 I mean, what, I mean, you know, and I, and I said, in order for you to make these people listen to what you, what you, what you're saying, they need to hit, they need to feel it in their heart on what you're saying in order for them to listen. And that's stories, stories that hit them right in the heart and think to himself, wow, geez, I'm empowered by what Kevin's Kevin's done in his story and that as well. I'm empowered by what Sol has kind of um kind of kind of said. And that's what makes a successful program. They need to relate to it, not stand there and go, hey, listen, 2019, you know, nine suicides a day, blah, 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 the whole thing, you know, um, because a lot of people go, yeah, okay, what's well, your stats? Tell me something that's gonna that's gonna move me. It's gonna move my heart. It's gonna, you know, in, that I've gone through. Guarantee you, every single person that watches this podcast has gone through something, whether it's depression, anxiety, or whatever they've gone through, mental health pro uh, problems they've gone through in their life. It's just about kind of one of those things that uh, they need to kind of identify and just kind of talk, just have conversation. You talk about it a lot in that so. It's incredible how effective storytelling can be. And, you know, everyone's worried so much, especially in Australia. There are groups that are worried about this or in America about safe messaging. But we really need to be thinking about effective messaging. Yeah. We need to be safe, yes. But we need to be effective in changing a life. Yeah. And people often say to me, Kevin, you can't talk about the bridge <laughs> and your attempt off the bridge because that's triggering to some people. I would conversely say, if I don't talk about the bridge and what I did there, how do we raise a net at the bridge and stop the suicides there forever, which is what we're doing right now. It took us 20 years with the Bridge Rail Foundation, Paul Muller, Dave Hall, my father, Patrick, Kevin Hines, who co-founded the, the Bridge Rail Foundation with those individuals. And right now the bridge net is being built. And as of November of 2023, not one more person will ever again die off that bridge. And if we didn't talk about the means, we would have never come to this end, to, to the stopping of the suicide. So I say that we need to be effective and move the needle forward as opposed to being uh, single-minded and thinking about the suicide prevention of 60 years in the past. These, th this data comes from 60 years ago. It's not valid today. We need to move forward. Um, but so I want to ask you um, a little something about 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 what you deal with outside of the ring. Um, I want to ask, and, and, and maybe this has not happened to you, but I'm just, I, if I'm find myself curious, have people ever challenged you to a fight out of the ring? And if so, how do you handle that kind? How do you defuse a situation like that? If that happens. So after, after watching um, Cobra Kai um, and in um, Karate Kid, no, I'm just joking, but um, <laughs> That, you know, people kind of see me, but I, I kind of diffuse the situation anyways. But uh, whether I'm at a pub or at somewhere kind of where people are drunk or whatever, I, very rarely have we ever, ever had anyone kind of, um, you know, it, it, if I if it does get to that stage, I'm pretty good at diffusing things. Yeah. And, I, and I just kind of say, hey, man, I'm off duty, man. I'm not kind of, you know, probably beat me up anyway, so just chill. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'll just, I just diffuse the situation. At the, end of the, at the end of the day, my thing is, hey, and then I'll pull them up on, on things. Hey, listen, be kind. Yeah. Because you know what I what I might be going through or whatever you're saying to someone else um, that uh, that you might just trigger them and all of a sudden they might have a go, but they might be going through something in their life that, uh, and then they go, oh, okay, now you are right. But I've never had any kind of issues, but, um, you know, any uh, pub issues or anything. Yeah. You know, people want to pull me up or or anything like that so i've been pretty fortunate 
I mean, there's still good aside. No, I'm, I'm, right? yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad to, to hear that because I would hate that if that, that happened to you. And I, I know, I know there are stories of people like, you know, um, you know, Mike Tyson who've dealt with things like that yeah. and, and it just gets out of hand. And I'm, I'm grateful that hasn't happened to you. Um, and now, yeah, now, so, oh, go ahead. No, it's like <laughs> that, that Mike Tyson, <laughs> like who, who in their right mind, would start poking at Mike Tyson on a plane. On a plane. <laughs> Why would they do that? What do they think is going to happen? But the, but the people like that are starved for attention. That's what it is. Yeah. They're starved yeah. for attention. They want people to take the clicks with their phone. They want it to get on social media. They want to be Insta famous. And it's very pathetic and sad that that happened. And I feel bad for Mike because he didn't yeah. deserve that reaction and that and that egging on. But yeah. what do you think is going to be the end result of that? Of course, it's going to, you know. Um, uh, but, but, you know, uh, moving forward, I, I think you, know, you briefly touched upon it in the beginning of the podcast, but I, I'm wondering if you can go a little bit deeper into it. Um, uh, let's talk about your, your Tongan heritage. Uh, I understand with the, with the self-education I've done recently in preparing for this podcast, that it is a rite of passage in the Tongan culture for your life story and the story of, I believe your ancestors to be given to the art of tattooing. And I, and I've seen your, your beautiful tattoos uh, when you're in the ring, they're, they're, they're phenomenally done and very, yeah, there, there you go. Wow. Uh, amazing. Um, you want to take your shirt off Kevin or just leave it on? Go for it. Go <laughs> for it. Come on. No, let's I'm do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but your father, it's my understanding. And tell me if this is accurate. Your father took it to your first tattoo at 15. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And this, I, yeah, and, and this would be re repeated throughout your life, and, and and milestones in your life, and yeah. the patterns portrayed significant Tongan symbols. Can you tell us what some of those symbols mean, and really, more importantly, what they mean to you and your family? Um, it's like a um, like. So, if you actually look here, if you can see my bicep on how big it is, yeah. um, the reason why it's so big because I do bicep curls, and then it just makes the tattoo look bigger, like better. There you go. Just yeah, but um. But in saying that, um, your podcast is going to go through the roof now that uh, you know <laughs> nearly took my shirt off, Kev. But um, so a lot of it, the stuff on here symbolizes uh, where we're from. Obviously, um, you know the warriors back in the day, um, Tokelau um, with a hook. So here's this: there's a hook on like these spears and stuff like that. And also there are um, things on my chest where it's like a bird. So if you look on the flag of the Tongan flag, it's like a, a, a white dove. So it's like peace, uh, but also other stuff in there that kind of symbolizes out. It's like a, a pathway to a warrior kind of thing. So, um, and some of the stuff on there are designed um, for our, like our family designed uh, for, you know, it's kind of hard to explain, but, um, but they have a certain way of, you know, when I rocked up to, when I see my uncle just to kind of to get my arm stuff done and he said oh he said we'll hop in the car we'll go for a drive we went for a drive all of a sudden we I was sitting there the guys pulled my pulled my um, thing I started drawing on my on my arm I said what is he doing and then he's like um and it's like you're getting a tattoo and I was like oh really geez I thought mate you couldn't give me like notice at least like a week notice to kind of start you know get myself ready for it like <laughs> um and i had to literally sit there for the whole time normally people will get one one part done they'll come back and get the other part done the whole time i had to sit there and get it all the whole thing done with the lining and then the coloring and it made it hurt but it was re rewarding in a way that but if i stopped then it'll kind of be whether it's disrespectful kind of you just literally have to sit there and get it done I have friends like Tai Tuivasa, you know, fights in the UFC now that, yeah. um, and other other people that uh, have got their their their, their tattoo, um, the chief tattoo. So from their knees up to their waist, that takes about a week. But that's the old style where they kind of where they're tapping. Um, I know Jason Momoa just got his one on the side of his head here, yeah. the Hawaiian kind of tattoo thing, and he got it old style as well. So, um, but that's that hurts um it's uh but but it's rewarding after you get it done you think yourself like i've done something for my family um the family heritage so um but something that i want to get my son to do as well so he's six, 16 he's six foot six six foot seven but i want him to get he's done um he's in year 12 um so i want him to get his done like very soon so probably in the next kind of three months so wow. 
and it doesn't matter, you know, people wait till they're 18. Oh. In our tradition, our tradition, we get it done pretty early. So it's incredible and, and it's beautiful how it expresses your whole family's history and heritage and ancestry. And it's 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 pretty impactful when you when you just just looking upon it is is almost mesmerizing. But um uh so you know they say you came from the school of hard knocks and it helped you prepare for yourself in the fighting arena. <laughs> Your parents had exposed you to uh, the tough plantation life in Tonga as a young child. Um, what was that like? How, how did it help shape what is now, I, I believe, to be your incredible work ethic and hustle and grind? What do you think? Um, it was good. Um, I think um, I was always like with my my grandpa. I was always with him. Um, we used to, used to go to the plantation and and uh, um, and when you talk about you know you're not just weeding at your backyard and this is just the whole bush of just kind of weeding you have a machete you start cutting down things but um, you know my cousins used to kind of run up the coconut trees and uh, um, but it's 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 so it's so good it's one of those kind of things that as a child growing kind of growing up there it's like it's uh it's just, it's the island life you know um, I got um, not sure if you're supposed to say this on, on on your podcast, but I got circumcised there. So um, in Tonga, traditionally circumcised. So not in a hospital where they give you a needle, you're falling asleep, you wake up and you're circumcised. In Tonga, you're awake. There's no needle that uh, it's going to numb anything. You go there, there's a group of kids that are lining up and we're standing there with, uh, it's called a, a dubenu. A dubenu is like a lava lava kind of thing. They wear in Hawaii where they, so you're holding that there and you're waiting there's probably about 30 kids kind of lining up and one after the other. And then you can start hearing screaming. <laughs> and oh, you think, God. oh, shit. So, <laughs> as, as, as a, and then my brother went before me and, and um, I could hear him and I could hear the guy talking to my brother and he goes, Oh, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, how are you going? And then as they're, they're talking, he's gone bang. And, and kind of, anyway, my brother's screaming and he's like, And then I had to go and, and then, <laughs> Oh, it's terrible. Then they wrap you up, and then they they send you home, and you basically you're sitting there, kind of recovering. Oh. And there's a way. So every every day you go, um, and there's no like antiseptic creams or anything like that. It's like full on Tongan style, island lifestyle. You go to the beach, you sit in the water, get the salt water in, and then oh, you go back up. Come on, and then you go home come, there. come on. So there's oh. no need to numb anything. It's like full on style kind of um wow you know, fresh off the boat kind of style <laughs> that's unbelievable and you're you're a better man than me so yeah. I, you're a better man than me so if anyone's watching this podcast you can go to Tonga and get it done that way if you want yeah just show up and ask, <laughs> ask for that to be done okay oh my goodness on on a lighter note so uh yeah. Um, you have a wonderful mentoring program called Hulk Kids MMA, in which yep. you mentor teens in every aspect of life. Please tell us about this program, how it helps kids, and how people can help your cause. So we've got a so we've kind of changed it in a way of renamed it um, Strong Minds, Strong Schools. Okay. So um, so it's kind of like our Strong Minds, Strong Minds program for mining, but uh, we've thought helping these kids at a younger age and educating them into um, into mental health so they understand the support systems that uh, they understand and educated on on mental health um, as soon as they get into the big world they are they, they they're educated on you know whether it's signs looking out for signs whether it's the kind of um, things that people might go through and they're educated on mental health because at this moment, when we go on to mind sites or we talk and do presentations, a lot of people don't even know what the EAP is or or don't even know support services, whether it's Lifeline or they don't know how to ring them or they don't even know what to do. So, um, but having our program kind of educating these kids at a younger age would hopefully, um, um, as they get into the, the real world, um, you know, they're educated onto, on, onto stuff when things get hard, when they start getting stressed, whether it's work related or whether it's just life in general, they know that there is support to, um, services out there that they can reach out to and just having those common conversations. A lot of our stuff is a lot of um, um, sharing in a way of kind of sharing stories and, and stuff and also kind of talking, uh, reaching out, a lot of bullying programs. We do bullying programs in that as well, which is really good. Um, because that's a massive thing, especially with social media. Um, you know, getting kids to kind of um, 
stop, you know, walk away and kind of tell somebody. Um, just kind of things that uh, will help these kids um, because it's it's our youths, right? Um, and it's just crazy how, you know, social media has taken everything to another level. But back in the day when we were growing up, Kev, it's like, you know, to actually go to your mate's house. I used to hop on a bike, ride to my mate's house, knock on the door. It goes, oh, is, you know, is Kev there? Or is, you know, and I said, oh, no, he's not. He's out. So I said, okay, hop on my bike, ride another, you know, 10 kilometers back home because he wasn't there. It, but nowadays, you just text text on the phone. You know, people rely on that, on on text messaging and playing gaming and stuff like that. So the everything has evolved around in, in the last, you know, 15 years, 20 years, you know, so... But I guess we, the more more we can help educate, um, the, the better the better it is. But it's kind of frustrating when you start seeing the stats, the suicide stats and stuff, climbing every year. But we can only do what we can, right? You know, so it's extremely frustrating, and we see it all around the world. And we can only do what we can do. We're going to keep fighting. We're going to keep working hard to to try to save one life at a time and help ch help change a life one life at a time. And and a family's uh, li lives, um, but it is, it, it's hard to see, you know, I, I, I've lost 16 people I care about to suicide, one of them five days ago. So, it, it, you know, it's, um, I, I feel like I'm just waiting for that next number to hit, you know, waiting for that next person that I know that's going to disappear before their time. And it breaks my heart, it breaks my heart. Um, so you speak often in your book, face your fears, I think it's out of Penguin Press, right? So, so yep. people, people can find it there. About going to live with your uncle and how you had to fight for scraps of food in between beatings your uncle would give you with things like sticks and bats or fists or whatever he had available. And you say you'd been broken, beaten, and destroyed. Can you tell us about that aspect of your childhood and how you overcame that aspect, or rather, got out of that terribly violent living situation. What, when, when did things begin to change? Um, I think, um, you know, it's 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 when I ran away, when I took off from Newcastle. But um, in saying that, Newcastle was an eye opener as a kid, but not all the time was bad. You know, some really great moments of my life spent with my cousins. And um, funny moments like, you know, just it was just the connection that I would have my cousins and stuff. We catch up now. We laugh about a lot of stuff that we used to do as a kids, as, as kids. But like I said, it's the Tongan culture. Yeah. Um, it's the Tongan culture. And he might have known, not known any better. Yeah. But from what he went through, maybe he, he got a smack, you know, and he's just kind of carried it on and thinking that's just normal. But in Australia, it's kind of not normal. Yeah. But um, but it's one of those things that, uh, like I like I said, it's made me the, the person who I am, and and I guess getting away from that, um, which I kind of took off and and uh, ran, and and hid underneath some I was hiding under someone's house, uh, the, I don't know whose house it was, but in in Newcastle, some of the houses are built on stilts, so they come off so high off the ground, so I crawl over the house and crawl to the front, and it's funny how in life when you kind of when you're stuck in that moment and, and uh, whether you're in jail or you're in dire straits, whether it's financially or just in life in general, that the one person you kind of look to is um, is is God. Like you kind of pray, like, you know, and I, I used to do that at night time. I used to kind of pray, dear God, one day I want to do something. I want to be somebody. I didn't know whether it was 30 years down the track, I'm going to be sitting here doing a a um, a, a podcast with, uh, with Kevin. Uh, but I didn't know how my life was going to end up, whether it was doing movies or whether it's fighting in the UFC, but I just didn't want to be in that position as a kid underneath that house. Plus, I was hungry in that as well. I was like, oh, dear God, when I get all this money, I'm going to buy 10 buckets of KFC, cheesecake, uh, McDonald's, <laughs> kind of Subway and all this. I used to think all these kind of great foods, you know, like I was just so hungry, like ice cream, all the ice cream I can get. Um, but as a kid kind of growing, you think to yourself, geez. And I was surviving literally on um, what people give their dog, you know, you know, if, you know, leftover food and stuff like that. So, um, but, you know, you start to get hungry after a couple of days. You think, oh, what do you eat? Um, but it was my safe haven kind of thing and what I, where I was. But in saying that, um, even before I ran away, I, I kind of found refuge at a, at a Catholic church. I was an altar boy as a kid. And um, it was it was great for me because I got to get away. But also kind of um, it was something that I, I did in the morning at 6 a.m. where I, I did church and then 
did the altar service and then kind of went to school after that. Um, kind of nighttime, I used to put my pajamas over my school clothes, get up in the morning, and, and I was already ready for school out the door. And I shot up out the door as quick as I could. Um, but uh, it's those kind of stories you think to yourself, oh, geez, I used to do that. Um, you know, and, and just a lot of things that I kind of sit and kind of, and, and, and whether it's reminiscing or kind of think, wow, like what I've gone through in life <clears throat> to where I am today, you know, where of, um, in, you know, helping people and whether, you know, kind of sh presentations, sharing stories, sharing my story, helping other people kind of share their story. I do have to pat myself in the back because I didn't just go through that. And then I went on, on a downhill, he was, you know, spiral. I kind of found things that helped me that uh, on what I was going through, that it helped me feel better about myself, whether it's punching the boxing bag, whether it's running on the treadmill, whether it's doing something and whether it's playing basketball, rugby, whatever I found and eventually start hitting with the UFCs is kind of helped me at the end. And that was it. You know, I had to find it on my own. I didn't have Soul the Hulk uh, or, or Kevin Hines or whoever it is telling me, hey, listen, it's important you exercise because there is a lot of benefits from it. Increases brain serotonin, increases liver endorphins, all these great things that help you. Um, I didn't have anyone telling me that. I had to found, find it out myself. And I think it's one of those things where finding it out myself that helped me and me telling people, hey, listen, this is what helped me going to the gym. A lot of people don't like going to the gym. And uh, me just kind of say, we'll find something that you like, whether it's meditation, whether it's yoga, Pilates or whatever it is, go for a walk, whatever it is that helps you um, and, you know, kind of finding it. And the UFC has really, really helped me, you know, in, in, in some sort of way. But again, I don't like fighting. So, yeah, it's kind of weird. I actually can understand it. You, you, you don't like fighting, but you you had been given this purpose and obviously you've lived an incredibly pur purposely driven life. You've helped a lot of people and the, the UFC was, a uh, was a path you took. Uh, and I, I think it was, it was uh, amazing your success there. And, and, and I know, I know it was an up and down situation. It was, it wasn't yeah. easy. It wasn't something that was simple for you, but you really, uh, you really worked extremely hard to get where you were and, and, and to achieve the things you've achieved, which, which are absolutely incredible. And you, you know what, Kev, like when we're talking about that, and sorry to interrupt you, but a lot of the things like, a lot of, I get this question a lot. It says, have you seen your uncle? And I was like, uh, yeah, I did. I actually went and seen him. And I, part of my healing process was to face my fears. And um, and he was something, someone that I feared, like I was scared of a lot, you know, and, and kind of going to see him. I really wanted to face him and kind of talk to him, you know, um, on some of the things that he, he'd done. But I, and I can't blame him for what he what he's what he's done. But I understand that it might have been the way he was brought up as well, um, and you know, kind of disciplined um, his kids. And um, but in saying that, I went and seen him. And some things in life, people cannot forgive. Like you know, people are different in in, in a way they forgive. But in order for me to move forward in my life, in, in order for me to move forward to the next chapter of my life, I needed to forgive. And when I seen him, he said, sorry. Remember kind of one of those things that uh, really powerful would have helped me move forward and everything just off my shoulders just went, oh, it's like, uh, like it was just, everything just went off my shoulders and I gave him a hug and and I said to him, I forgive you. And um, and, and then I got, and I got, got back in the car, I was in tears. Um, but I, I, it's like I rested my 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 soul. Everything was just rested in a way that uh, okay, now I can move forward in my life. And but everyone's different. I'm not saying that everyone should forgive, but people need need for me. I had to forgive him to kind of move forward in my life, and which I did. And and I love my my. I do love my family, my cousins. I I do love them. Um, and you know we've gone through a journey together, and that so. But it's one of those things that um, that it's made me the person that I am and I'll never change what happened. You know, I'll never change that because it's 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 who I am now. So and I'm thankful. And I'm thankful that I'm alive. I'm thankful that I'm here. And I'm thankful that I'm actually on one of the best podcasts in the world. That's uh the hindsight podcast. Thank you. So I, I really appreciate that. And I think that, you know, going to your uncle and and giving that forgiveness, not 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 everyone can do that. 
And yeah. when you can do that, it's one of the most beautiful things in the world because you do, you find yourself at peace. You yeah. find yourself in this serenity that is washing over you. Yeah. You were able to say what you did was what you did. W yeah. Was it because of me? And, yeah. and, you know, and you think about the, like, as you describe the Tongan culture and how that's a part of it, you know, um, you know, people have learned behaviors. They don't just do that because they're trying to hurt someone. They have yeah. learned behaviors that are their norm. And, and, and that's what really sounds like it went on with you and, and your, your yeah. family. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm at peace with it. And that was yeah. also, and, and that kind of led me to a lot of the stuff that I was going through throughout my career and throughout my life that, uh, that I was dealing through because I was dealing through a lot of mental health struggles throughout my whole career. It's a lot of mental health problems that I was going through. I think when I made that decision to take my own life it, and, it, and I don't, don't talk about suicide lightly, you know, I understand the ripple effect that it's going to happen. If I was to take my life today, you know, my kids, my loved ones, family, brothers, sisters, you know, um, the people that are close to me that are connected with me, I understand the ripple effect that's going to happen. And you talk about this a lot, um, that, uh, that's going to happen. I understand that, but I didn't, I don't, I didn't want to die, but it was the pain that I was going through in my heart, in my soul that I thought there was nothing else I could do. Um, and I remember watching your video and you spoke about it when you went and said goodbye to your mom, your mom and dad, they didn't know what was, what was, what was happening. And I did, I, I did the same, but, um, and then even when I, when I stood there on the chair about to take my own life and I went to a place, Bunnings, what we call it here, it might be called Walmart there and, and kind of bought a rope and, I, and, and I was standing on a chair. I had the rope around my neck and I about to take my life and, sending a text message to my oldest daughter, um, my two daughters, and it's just not telling them what I'm about to do, but just tell them that I love them and I'm, and I'm sorry for, you know, for being a failure in their life. Um, as I was writing that text message and texting my daughter, um, I replied back. My daughter replied back with a, with a text message, which saved my life. If it was one minute later, um, I wouldn't be sitting here doing this podcast with you. If it was, it was literally ten seconds, and I don't even know if normally I send my girls a text message or my, or my son, and hours later I get a reply text message, you know. And um, but within ten seconds of me sending that text message, she replied back with a text message. I don't know if God intervened and said, "Hey, listen, you need to you need to message your dad. He's in dire straits. Message him right now." I don't know if it was that or if it's just she just messaged me back and, and kind of saved my life. And that reply text message that she said was, I love you too, dad. Can you take me to a party tonight? And um, it was like, I like, I went, wow. I kind of, I, I checked the message. And even though it was a, a, a simple party, because if she had just said, I love you too, dad, I still would have taken my life. Yeah. But because it was like, uh, uh, can you take me to a party tonight? It was even though it was a party that she wanted me to take to, take her to a party, walk her to the front door. Any boys try to chat to her, uh, chat to her, armbar and choke him out. Anyway, that's another <laughs> that's another podcast that we're going to be talking about. But uh, that's it's another story for another day. But it, she she actually needs me because a lot of the time that my kids were growing up, I was never there for them because I was always away. Whether I was in the states, when I was in America, uh, I was training out of Temecula whether I was at Thailand, just training. It's one of those things that I had to, for in order for me to kind of put food on the table, I needed to go away and work. And I, and it brings me to that to that time where, and, I, and it made me think when I kind of woke up and I kind of thought to myself, geez, what, you know, what am I doing? And, and it made me realize if I was to take my life today, in five to 10 years time, less or more, my daughter's going to go, you know what, dad didn't give a shit. He didn't come to anything I did at school. He was never there for me. You know what, he took his life, I'm going to take my life. If she has kids, her kids are gonna. You know what, mum, dad didn't care about mum. You know what, he didn't. He wasn't there for for mum. He took his life. You know, mum's left us to fend for ourselves. You know, she's took. She's taken her life. I'm gonna take my life. So it ends up becoming a ripple effect. So one of those most best thing I've ever done is obviously get off the chair and 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 see somebody and, and go and see some professional. And because I wanted to be there for, for 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 my family, you know, and in order for me to be there, I needed to get help. And yeah. I realized that. But it's it's a hard way of kind of realizing it when you're just about to take your own life. But it, it was one of those things that I didn't see. There was it was just like a it was like a black road where I was just walking towards this, this road. Nothing else was going to stop me from doing what I was about to do. Um, and um, when you're stuck in that hole, it's like nothing else can 
can't stop you. And I, I know, and I was kind of literally in that hole. Um, and I'm so glad that I went and kind of, you know, got help and, and, uh, and seen somebody, but it made me realize though, Kev, when I do talk about this, um, that my kids, you know, they, they didn't care about it. if I was kind of hanging out with, you know, um, when I was in the U S and going to Arnold Schwarzenegger's kind of ranch every year for his charity called after school, All Star. they didn't care about anything like that, putting food on the table, sending them to the best schools. You know, what they did care about is, um, and people can relate to this when they do watch his podcast, that your kids, all they want is if I'm, you know, they're about to do a hundred meter sprint at a school carnival. They look back, Mum, dad's here. Awesome. I'm ready to go. I'm going to run as fast as I can. Standing on stage, about to do a drama thing that they're about to do. Um, and they're looking out. Oh, and I've been kind of learning this for the last three months. Look, at, oh, mum, dad's here. I'm going to give them the best performance. This drama thing is just me being there for them, you know, kind of. And that's something that I struggle with trying to be there because it's the sacrifices that I had to make to 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 put food on the table, give them the, the best education, give them something in life that, that I never had. So... Um, so I kind of realized that for, for a long time, but it's time. It's, it's, I guess it's those moments and decisions that you make in life. It's every minute, every second is so important, right? Every hour. And we take life for granted. And, uh, and hopefully when people do kind of watch this podcast, don't take life for granted because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day. Um, so, you know, kind of go after it and, and believe, be happy and kind of, uh, be kind as well. So. That's right. Don't don't take life for granted and don't take the people in your life for granted. Don't yeah. take the people that you get to meet in person, digitally, virtually uh, every day because you know you never know what gifts they could bestow upon you with their wisdom and it could uh, it could end up helping to change your life, which is which is absolutely beautiful. Um yeah. you know, so uh, uh I'd like to to know what what you're working on now and I'd also like to know in, in the second part of that question is is why is helping other people with their wellness and mental health so important to you um so we're working on um so we're doing programs now for the the schools rolling out these programs throughout you know wa and hopefully we can um we want to get these the, our programs implemented into their school programs so um so it gets rolled out um we're also doing stuff for obviously the mining as well. We're, we're pretty big into mining as well with, with our programs, um, our strong minds, strong minds programs, but it's, 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 it's those things that, um, that I love doing because I'm pretty passionate about it. Like yourself, because I've, I've been there. I've, I've, and I guess this is the reason why I'm still here because, and I think I truly, I truly believe this, that, uh, that you know, God has said, "Mate, this is not your time to go. I've got another job for you to do, and that's so. And this is my journey on on what He has for me to do is is help save people's lives, encourage people, empower people, um, and uh, to you know to help them get through what they're going through. And like you said, if it's just one one life that we're saving, that's one life." Or saving is is you know you can't put money on that as well and but yeah I, I love what I do and uh, the reason why I'm so passionate I guess it's like it, as we go we go on in life we get older we we learn I remember kind of having a conversation with somebody and and they were saying to me we're, we're talking about life in general and you know kind of decisions that we make and and I was saying to them look don't take life for granted. Like, and I told him a story about my mum. So my mum passed away five years ago from diabetes. Mm. And uh, I remember kind of talking to mum and, and you know, I used to come come home and come come back and I said, mom, mum, how are you going? And she goes, oh, son, it's good to see you. Come sit, you're always working and you're always busy. And I used to be like, yeah, hang on, mum, two seconds. I'm just sending a text message. She goes, son, put your phone down. Let me talk to you. I haven't spoken to you all week. Like, you've been so busy. And I said, mum, mum, hang on two seconds. Like, let me send this text message out. Let me send this email out. One time, mum, mum grabbed the phone and kind of put the phone down and said, "I'm going to give you um, an important kind of advice, and son. This is important advice for you." And I said, oh, "Okay, what's the advice, mum?" And she said, "Fame and money will mean nothing when I'm gone." And I used to go, "Fame and money will mean nothing when I'm gone." Uh -huh. Okay, mum, no dramas. 
I understand now that she's gone, that I would give away everything I, 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 off my own back just to have 15 minutes with my mum and, uh, you know, just to kind of have that time back. But that's time, right? That's every minute, every second, every hour. I'll give everything away just to have 15 minutes to sit there with my mum and have a conversation with her. Yeah. But we learn from our mistakes, right? And it's one of those things that as we learn, we can tell the story on what we've learned and, and hopefully people don't make that same mistake that uh, don't take things for granted. That's an important message as well for people out there. It's a great message for our listeners and viewers. And uh, um, if if you, so if you could give one message to specifically to struggling Tongan youth right now about resilience, what would that message be? Um, do something that, well, do something that you love. It's a message to all the, the to Tong and the growing up and have these kind of important conversations, talk about things that they might be struggling with. Um, because we've gone through the days where we used to keep a lot of stuff in, especially in the Tongan culture, keep stuff in. You can't say that, you can't say this. It's a lot, not with, only with our culture, but, you know, with other different cultures as well, all the old school kind of cultures um, that, um, that you know, just have a conversation, just talk, um, especially with our youths kind of growing up, um, especially with Tonga and that as well, because they also have had hard upbringings in that as well. And, uh, and I'm sure, you know, you've got other places out around the world that in countries that go through a lot of struggles and stuff, stay strong um stay strong that's you know and just kind of do things that make you happy you know so um whether you have no money i think having no money you get you more happier right yeah. <laughs> look 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 at uh look at the, the the country of bhutan and and how they use a barter system in their national uh their national uh they they their gross national happiness is how they measure their well-being is how happy they are um, yeah. it's, it's a phenomenal uh, culture and it, it, it just goes to show us that we don't need money and material things. We need people in our lives that love us yeah. and that we, and that we love unconditionally uh, yeah. to, to wrap things up. I've, I've got a few rapid fire questions for you to ask. And if you can answer these questions in three words or less, yep. are you ready? Here we go. Five ready, rapid yeah. fire questions, three words or less. Show the Hulk. What is your favorite color? Black. Black. Okay. What Never is your favorite? What that was one word. That's perfect. What is your favorite food? KFC. KFC. Ha. Okay. Who or what do you love most? Um uh kids. Good. Perfect. All right. Where or what is your safe place? Um Safe place is doing a doing a presentation. Doing a presentation and, and yeah. helping. Just, that, that's my safe place because it's like, yeah, I, I feel good. I feel so warm. I, I feel like happy when I'm when I'm doing that. That's my kind of and and I know that I'm helping people. That's my Love safe that. place. Yes, and this one finally. And feel free to make this more than three words for this one because it's this is an important one. This is the question I'm asking you so that your answer can benefit this audience. Why, Soa, is this life worth living? It's worth living because for me, um, I've got a second I got I got a second chance. Um, but it's worth living because of the people that I help. That's why it's worth living that I get to encourage and empower and save. That's why it's, why it's for me, it's worth living because it's, um, yeah. Absolutely. In saying, in saying that I've fought in, in front of thousands of people, millions of people watching on TV and the UFC, but I didn't get the fulfillment that I got, that I get from actually walking in, then, then actually walking into a, a group of kids or a presentation with 50 people in it. I get more enjoyment and more fulfillment that uh, doing that than walking out in front of 20,000 people at Mandalay Bay and millions of people watching on TV. It doesn't compare. Yeah. 
this life is worth living for the benefit and the and the beauty that we can express and give to others. Giving back is why life is worth living. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's perfect. Okay, so uh, um, I, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for sharing your amazing story and message here on the Hindsights Podcast. We are so incredibly grateful for your time, energy, and powerful story uh, and the compassion you have for your fellow human beings is next next to none. So thank you thank so much you. for coming on. Really appreciate it. It means the <laughs> world. I know we're going to connect later and do some great work together. I can't wait sure. until that day comes. Uh, everybody listening, viewing, watching, subscribing, and you better subscribe to the Hindsight Podcast if you haven't done it already. Everybody watching right now and listening right now, if you are in if you're if you're dealing with brain pain, if you have mental struggles, I want you to fight them. I want you to fight those mental struggles. And I want you to be here tomorrow and every day after that. And Soa and I want to express to you that you are loved, you are valued, you are worthy, that you matter, that you must retrain your negative inner critical voice to be a positive one, one day at a time by reciting, repeating, and then believing those positive things. And everyone listening right now if you if nobody else says it today we love you and we want you to stay thank you everyone for listening to the hindsight's podcast uh please come back and tune tune back in next week 6 p.m eastern standard time on thursday as we drop a podcast every thursday for you from wonderful human beings like so the hulk to people far beyond and um, everyone who's listening, be here tomorrow and every day after that. Take care, be well, and I'll talk to you next week. Bye. Thanks, Thanks Soa. Thanks, Kevin. Margaret and I love sharing stories of people who have triumphed over incredible adversity. For more content and inspiration, go to kevinhindstory.com or visit us on all social medias at Kevin Hines Story or on youtube.com slash Kevin Hines. <laughs>